Alaska, the continent in the Inuit language. Libby is a young American full of energy. After her studies, she decided to come back to live in Homer, where she was born, to be as close as possible to the mountains and to the sea, her two passions. The myth of Alaska is what brought Lionel here. This French globetrotter became a guide in the Katmai region, land of grizzlies, a virgin land with the largest population of brown bears in the world. Farther north, the roof of America with Daniel. This lady belongs to the club of bush pilots, a very select group. There was a year that I spent in Alaska. My first year, I never had a car. I went everywhere by an airplane or a mountain bike, so. And to me, that was a dreamland, or still is. The Kenai Peninsula in southern Alaska is a land of volcanoes, endless forests and fjords, a land sculpted by the sea and glaciers. Living here means accepting nature's implacable law, cold, snow, winters that are seven months long, rain, mud, mosquitoes in the summer, and Libby loves it all. For her, returning to the land where she was born was the obvious thing to do. This land has gotten under her skin, tattooed even, on her ankle. Eight stars, the emblem of Alaska. After I finished university, it was a pretty easy decision to come back to Alaska. It's just a wild, open place where there's still a lot of room to breathe, and you can be far away from all the hassles of traffic and shopping malls and cars and, and just too many people. And you can get away to where life really is, which is in the mountains and in the forests, just natural wonders. Kachemak Bay near Homer, Alaska, is home to the biggest crabs in America and to the biggest Greenland halibut in the Pacific. And that's no fish story. So fishermen flock here to enjoy miraculous fishing at least once in their lifetimes. And Libby turns sailor to teach them the basics of fishing. Generally, I run a wilderness backpacking school for children. But sometimes I fill in on the charter boat just because it's fun and it's, there's good money in it. And um, it's, I like being out on the water. I think it's really fun and it's always, it's always a pleasure, so. Listen up, I'm gonna teach you how to fish. Okay. In case you forgot, my name's Libby Chet's the other deck. Libby has her sea legs on, which can't be said for everyone on board the boat. In this region of the far north, you have to know how to adapt. People living here hold down several different jobs at a time. Libby is an English teacher in the winter. In summer, she's a mountain guide and a fishing guide. And she's just as at home on a boat up to her elbows in fish as she is in a classroom teaching English literature. A lot of young people come back. After going to university, they come back to Homer to work on the charter boats in the summertime. And um, there's not a lot of work in the winter, but in the summer, there's more work than there are people. So it's a, it's a good, good job to have. I like fishing because it's, it's fun, but I definitely prefer the mountains. At Libby's place, there's no running water, just a little cistern to collect rainwater that has to be boiled. As for the toilet, it's outside, summer and winter. Her farm, constructed by early 20th century immigrants, has a long history. The house was built on land granted to pioneers to grow food for the early gold hunters, seeking their fortunes in Alaska. This little house has been home to a good many dreams. It's the oldest farm in the region, and now it's home to Libby's dreams. Yeah. Avon is the grandson of pioneers from Switzerland, farmers who came in the 1930s. He also has decided to stay in Alaska. Like Libby, the mountains are in his blood. 
in Alaska, I feel like there is towns and the wilderness goes out. Everywhere else in the lower 48, I feel like the wilderness is always surrounded by the towns. And so people go from the towns into the wilderness. But in Alaska, because it's so big still, we, the towns are very small and we go out. And so it's the further you go, the more danger and just the more adventure and the more opportunities there, there are to see things that, that have never been seen and to go places where no one has ever been. So I like Alaska for that reason a lot. The generation of Libby's parents was part of the last great wave of American-style pioneers. In the 1960s, a lot of hippies left California for a more authentic lifestyle in Alaska. They all found their promised land and the space in which to be free. closest family friends from my mother's 60th birthday. Everything's special about Homer. We have beautiful scenery, wonderful people, really nice, close community. There's glaciers nearby and mountains, amazing fishing, and um, just a really nice arts community. Libby and Avon have just opened a new climbing route on one of the mountaintops across the bay. We're going with them on their last reconnaissance flight before winter. They have to make this trip in order to evaluate the difficulty of the climb and of the glacier. If all goes well, they'll be bringing groups of teenagers here next summer. Here's a really difficult spot for the pilot to land because it's a very small valley and he has to circle around and then land. Anything windy and it's gonna be a little bit tricky, so we're on his schedule. The, uh, the glacier pilots here and the bush pilots here are they're in charge, they're the number one, so we just kind of work by their schedule. There are a few things that I love more than being away from everyone else. I'm a very solo person. And when I'm out here in the wilderness, that's where I really feel at peace. Because there's nobody, to tell me what to do. There's nothing to distract me from myself or from the world around me, and I can really focus on what's most important to me, which is enjoying life. One place for sleeping, another for eating. One has to take all possible precautions to avoid unpleasant surprises. Bears are everywhere in these mountains. We tried to put everything away um, so that bears don't come around and can get into our camp. You can set up the, uh... I do my fire like my grandfather taught me to do my fire. This wood is high in um, turpentine. This is magnesium and opine wood. And the magnesium, when it's lit, it burns very hot. So the two of them together, this wood helps the magnesium catch on fire. A few meters from the glacier, the temperature hardly goes above five degrees Celsius. And this is summer. We're lucky. But we can't sit around the campfire for very long. In a few hours, we attack the glacier. Yeah. 
There are dozens of ice fields in the Kenai Peninsula, some of the largest in the world, and most of these frozen seas are practically inaccessible. This morning, the elements are against us. On the other side of the Pacific, thousands of kilometers away, a typhoon is starting to blow. We can feel it even here, and the mountain amplifies its effect. Just across the mountain range is the Gulf of Alaska, and so the weather comes usually from the Gulf of Alaska out there, and it comes over these mountains, and it just comes in real fast sometimes, strong winds. And because the glacier is very cold, it creates winds all on its own, too, that come and rush down the glacier sometimes. So uh, those are some weather concerns we have to think about. There's all kinds of volcanoes around here. We have um, Mount Augustine, Mount Eliamna, and Mount Readout. Mount Readout just erupted in April of this year, and it was a pretty big eruption. Um, it spewed ash for hundreds of miles. There's ash all over Homer and Anchor Point and all the way as far as the head of the bay. Um, up here, that's what you can see, all the black on the glacier is all from the volcanic ash. The glacier is alive. It's always moving. Libby and Avon have to come here regularly to update their knowledge of the mountain and to evaluate the dangers. This seemingly immobile mass is constantly changing. Crevices shift. And like everywhere else in the world, this immense sea of ice is receding inch by inch. The valley has been the same for a thousand years. The ice has moved back, of course. But people have not come here, and you know, there's no campsites, and the bears don't come and eat your food because they don't even know that they can. There's no reason for it to change in the past, and we try to keep it so there's no reason that it has to change in the future. You know, you always make sure your campfire is put out and cleaned up, and I try to scatter it and bury it so that you can't tell that anyone was even here, that this wasn't even a campsite, so that it can be preserved for the next people and for generations to come and also appreciate places like this. Avon's grandfather, the pioneer who came to build Alaska, handed down this philosophy to him. The earth is generous on condition you don't take everything from it. It's hard to believe, but even here, man's insatiable appetite is putting nature at risk. From the Paris suburbs to the vast stretches of Alaska, there are many worlds to cross. Lionel has seen them all, urged on by his yearning for adventure. I came to Alaska 30 years ago, so I've been here for 30 years. At first it was so I could make money to continue traveling, and I ended up staying. I was taken in by Alaska, captivated by the nature. In the beginning, I traveled around all over, by plane, by snow scooter, and then I wanted to share it all with other people. So after having worked as a baker and in restaurants, I felt like doing something a little closer to nature. I sold all my businesses and started working as a guide. The seaplane is the only way of getting to where we're going. Lionel is a nature guide, and his specialty is brown bears, the grizzlies that are the pride of the Alaskan people. Seatbelts on, everybody? Seatbelts? Yeah. We're going bivouacking with Lionel in the Katmai, a totally virgin region, 400 kilometers west of Anchorage. The 
The Katmai is a vast, uninhabited region of middle range mountains, lakes, volcanoes, and tundra. For nearly 100 years, the Katmai has been a protected area, a natural reserve. This land is sacred. Two or three times a year, Lionel sets up camp as near as possible to the bears. This time around, he's here with a team of animal photographers from Europe. When you're really isolated like this, if something's missing, there's no way you can get it. You have to have it with you. That means an enormous amount of planning, a lot of material. If you want to be completely safe, we need satellite telephones, weapons, good quality tents. If we forget something, we do without it. That's it. You never know what could happen. It could rain. The weather in the north changes very quickly. And then there are all the weather fronts that come from the east, from Siberia. There isn't a weather station every 20 kilometers here, so they have to rely solely on the satellite image, and sometimes that changes rapidly. This is the last sanctuary for one of the most legendary of animals, the brown bear. Nearly 3,000 of them have been counted in the Katmai region. Nowhere else on the planet is there such a concentration. You always want to stay with them a little longer. Really, these animals are so mysterious and captivating, close to us. It's like our childhood teddy bear come alive. At the end of the summer, the bears gobble down quantities of Pacific salmon. They can catch up to 80 a day. Every year at the same time, after an incredible journey, hundreds of thousands of salmon come to lay their eggs and then die in the rivers of Alaska, in the exact same spot where they had been born several years earlier. Yeah, that's perfect. And the bears also come back to the same fishing holes from one year to the next. The mother is dominant because she's managed to get rid of the male. With two cubs, she took enormous risks. She must have known that she would come out on top. It must have been a male she knew because you don't often see a female with young drive off a male of that age. The grizzly and the polar bear are the largest carnivores on Earth. The male grizzly can measure 2 meters 50, weigh 300 kilos, and charge at 50 kilometers an hour. It's always really impressive to see just how fast these huge hulks can move, to see the speed at which they run, because they're really huge creatures. They always come across as clumsy, but when they take off, they can move. There's always a good deal of, yeah, I'd say, of wonder involved when you see grizzlies so close. Because, well, they're mythical animals. This is the end of the road for these bright red salmon. They're living their final hours. They're exhausted and so they're easy prey. And that works out well because the bears have only a few weeks left to feast on them. This is their last big feed before they return to their lairs for the winter. But a Pacific salmon, however tired it is, won't go down without a fight. The Katmai is a land for adventure seekers. Patrick started out in Colorado and in several stages has traveled more than 5,000 kilometers in his little plane before finally flying over this territory where he has come to fish trout. Well, I, I enjoy the flying uh, more than the fishing. 
and uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's a nice way to relax, and uh, you appreciate a lot of things when you have the freedom of flight. You got to be careful, and you have to know your limits. And uh, the uh, the way to stay alive is to be more conservative. Uh, but but as you as you're here more, there's little tricks uh, that nature tells you that nature's changing, and uh, if you're aware of that and safe, uh, it's, it's a good time. A farmer in Colorado, Patrick is a wide open space addict. He loves Alaska and comes up to pitch his tent here several times a year. Sometimes we bring friends and family. Uh, one month ago, I bring my two nephews, 12 and 13 years old. We had a nice time. Alaska's fun when you share it. It's most fun when you share and show people. The country is so magnificent and extraordinary that I think I've caught the Alaska bug. I try to make it back here. This is my seventh almost consecutive year. The moment I board the plane to return to France, all I can think about is coming back again. You know, I feel very, very, very fortunate. I'm, uh, I feel honored and I feel blessed and I feel, uh, I don't know, something about Alaska, you, you, can't, uh, you can't explain it. This, this river right here might be the best rainbow river in the world. And to be here first, all by myself, it doesn't happen too often. The Katmai is Alaska's horn of plenty. Where man and animal cross paths, the extraordinary becomes possible. It's uh, the last frontier, the last place without a lot of rules, the last place with no people. You know, the last place that you can die in two weeks, they still don't know you're gone. You know, There's still a sense of adventure for Alaska, for most people. Fishing in this wild land is exclusively for pleasure, catch and release only. It's a question of philosophy. Right now, the, the trout get in behind the, the, the red salmon. The salmon are going up the rivers to spawn and lay their eggs. So right now, the trout will get behind the salmon. Slow down. Yesterday I was here, um, I left camp at 5.30, and I got back at 4, you know, so uh, my back starts to hurt, though. Yesterday I took a nap on an island like this. You always wake up looking for the bear. <laughs> Sound of Alaska. You know, bears, if you you make yourself as big as you can with bright colors and a lot of noise. Most of the time they leave. And uh, the minute you run, if you're gonna walk away, back up. But the minute you run, it's their character to chase. So uh, you just hold your ground and don't show any fear, your heart. This land is a magnet, in spite of the danger. Setting foot here is like delving as deeply as possible into yourself. 
It's an unforgettable apprenticeship of freedom. It's a return to the roots. Alaska is home to more than 70% of North America's brown bears. They are the pride and joy of Alaskans, who are even ready to accept a slowdown in economic development in order to protect this majestic animal. This has been happening in the Katmai for almost 100 years. Elsewhere, the bears were hunted and have almost disappeared. After a few hours' walk in the river, we find ourselves face to face with a whole family. This is the magical moment of the encounter, right in the middle of a feast. We try to get as close as possible to get good photos, but the bear's a huge predator, so there's always a risk. The rule is to not get closer than 50 meters to a bear, but sometimes they're all over the place. And if you back away from one, you find yourself closer to another bear. So in fact, we're quite often only 15 to 20 meters away. I found myself surrounded by bears, but they didn't show any sign of aggressivity. The most important thing to do is make yourself known to the bears so they can identify you. They're gone, come closer. There's a female and three little ones. The bear is an extremely solitary animal, changing its behavior during the feeding season when food is abundant. It becomes more tolerant of humans and even more tolerant of other bears. We take advantage of this. Because when you're as close as we are now, it's not a common situation. If there weren't salmon all over the place, it'd be impossible. In a few weeks, at the end of the spawning season, the red salmon will be gone from the rivers of Alaska, and the bears will be looking out for another source of food to satisfy their voracious appetites before going into hibernation. That's the sign for Lionel to leave. He'll have to wait another year before, once again, he will be able to approach these impressive predators. Suddenly, a freezing east wind starts blowing over the Katmai like a warning. There's no fighting it. It's time to go. We are only tolerated visitors in the land of the bear. Talkeetna holds a special place in the hearts of American pilots. It is here at the foot of Mount McKinley, the highest peak in North America, that the most important moments in the history of Alaskan aviation took place. This village remains the dream of many pilots even today. The airplane is still the easiest means of transportation in Alaska. Pancake breakfast at the old log cabin store. Sprinkle through the window, don't you bother with the door. Go on into the kitchen, fix yourself. Danielle is one of those famous Alaskan bush pilots who have the reputation of being among the best in the world. She can fly in the worst of conditions. I flew up here in my airplane nine years ago on a quick trip with some friends. Just decided to go on a long cross-country trip. And then I landed here and just saw all these airplanes on skis just taking off. It was overcast, but they were still getting to the mountain. Never saw McKinley, but just knew they were going up someplace and landing on a mountain with skis. And just was, yeah. No, I like the town. There was good music in town and just, I don't know, it just felt like a cool place. 
I can leave here and go fly up into the mountains, go hiking, go around a corner, run into a grizzly bear. And so you kind of feel like you're not living a protected life. It feels alive. About 80% of the state doesn't have any roads to it. So um, airplanes are the normal day-to-day -day travel. Uh, at one point, about 80% of uh, the people that lived in Alaska had a pilot's license. And about 50% of the people had um, airplanes. So some people uh, learned to fly, not because they loved it, but because they needed to get to their house or cabin. In winter, the extreme cold brings everything to a halt. Come spring, Danielle gets more and more missions. She drops climbers off at Mount McKinley's base camp. In summer, weather conditions permitting, she treats her passengers to a flight over the snow-capped peaks. Oh, we're flying up to the mountain. And up to the McKinley. The plane is the local taxi. It's the bicycle, too. It's a bus, and sometimes it's even a pickup truck. Flying from morning to night, that's why Danielle left the boondocks of Colorado to come live here. flight, uh, generally want to be in a beaver because of the old radial engine, the poop, 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 poop. you know, that, you know, it's a classic. It's like the Harley Davidson of airplanes, for sure. First year I spent in Alaska, I never had a car. I went everywhere by an airplane or a mountain bike. So, and to me, that was a dreamland, or still is. It's common not to have electricity for maybe two days, three days in the winter. And when it's 40 below, um, everything will freeze after one day. And that's a problem not just for water, but for canned food. Any, um, anything like that will ruin. There's no choice but to adapt to the climate. Danielle lives without running water in a converted container. She chose this life far from material constraints precisely because it gives her just what she needs and no more. Enough to eat, to live, and above all, enough to dream. The essentials. It's hard to explain, but I don't feel alone. 
feel connected to everything that goes around. Whereas if I'm in a city or more people, I feel more lonely. The more civilized thing gets, the more I feel lost. And here I don't feel lost. Some mornings here, I awaken and um, moose will come walking by. One morning I had a, a, a mother moose right outside this window, her back is like this high. And then the, uh, the calves are just walking around the little babies in the yard. And so you are reminded on how basic it is, necessities of life. Skis for landing on mountains, bog wheels for the tundra. Danielle knows how to handle it all. In no time, three shakes and a few turns of a wrench, she changes her plane's landing gear. I grew up in Colorado, and uh, my dad and my brothers were all car mechanics and airplane mechanics. So weekends were out at the airport, and weekdays were in the garages. I like mechanics. I grew up around it, so yeah. Okay. Danielle, going? Good. How's it going? going? Good. Ready to go rafting? I am ready. Awesome. Let's go check out where we can land. Today's mission is to drop Carl off near one of the region's many okay, rivers. Ready? I'm ready. In less than an hour, Carl, an adventure hunter, will be out in the bush. For the Alaskans, taking the plane to go rafting is like taking the bus to go play tennis. Even though they stopped making them 40 years ago, the Beaver remains the favorite plane of the Alaskan bush pilots. They're passed on from one owner to the next like collector's items. Though it's not extremely fast, it can carry a very large load. It was designed to land anywhere at relatively low speed. It's the perfect bush plane. This beaver, it has a history um, with some of its accidents it's had, but uh, probably the most famous is there was a murder that occurred in it. Uh, the owner had, had it on floats and landed in a river where his cabin was, and then he uh, left the airplane tied up, went to his cabin, and then the following day or so when he came back to his airplane, someone had rigged a, a shotgun on the door and he disconnected the airplane from the shore and pushed off and opened up the door and got shot right in the chest from the shotgun. So the airplane was drifting down the river and it took him a while to actually find the owner. Danielle doesn't use landing strips, but just plots of open land, one more improbable than the next. She flies over once to check it out, and two minutes later, the plane is on the ground. Okay, yep. thanks, Danielle. Bye-bye. Have a safe flight back. Yep. Carl is going to have to walk a little before getting into the water. From now on, he's on his own. But that's exactly what he came for. If there's a problem, he'll have to work it out for himself. Those who don't follow the rules of the game can end up paying for it with their lives. It's been raining for days now, on and off, and it rained hard last night, and the water is still coming up a little bit. And then this morning, we've had rain and sun and different things. 
But uh, you know what they say in Alaska, if you don't like the weather, wait five minutes or move five miles. That's Alaska, no guarantees. It's become uh, popular recently, pack rafting, where we take these rafts of about two kilos and we carry them into the wilderness and find some river to run out in the middle of nowhere. And you can take the raft out, you can blow it up, run a river, and then take out at another point, climb another mountain, go to another river, and it just allows you to look at a map in a whole new way. In Alaska, there's a lot of things that can be dangerous. You just really have to pay attention. You've got to be prepared in many ways. In my life jacket, I carry uh, waterproof matches. I carry a signal mirror. I carry energy bars. I carry an emergency blanket. I carry the bare minimum survival tools to survive in case I just lose my boat or something worse. We're ready. Most mountain rivers in Alaska are inaccessible. Going down them can take several days, and everyone knows it's a tough place. Even in summer, the temperature of the water rarely gets above 8 degrees Celsius. Enjoying simple moments like this in a breathtaking landscape. That's the lifestyle that many have chosen in Alaska. A simple and serene existence. Living here is feeling that you've found your place. We're only 30 kilometers down from the glacier where this water is coming from. This is the Shalitna River, which comes out of uh, the many glaciers on the east side of the central Alaska range. It's both uh, got some clear water from snow melt and the milky water from the glaciers. Now every river in Alaska was named by the natives. It ends in na, Shaletna, Susitna, Tokasitna, and that's how you know it's a river in an Indian name. Oh, look at my snow tree, I said, oh. Carl, looks like you're traveling a little light. I am traveling light. <laughs> hey, you want to join us for lunch? That would be great. That would be great. Where are you stopping? Oh, you know, down here just a little ways. Okay. So this canyon's going to open up a little bit. That'd be nice to get off these wet clothes for a little bit, get some sun on me. And... All right. The unexpected is everywhere. We run into Joe, another rafting fanatic. He looks like a trapper, but he was the Talkeetna grade school teacher for more than 30 years. These two are old friends. Hey, check it out, bear tracks. The strength of the people living here is that they're at one with their environment. When summer's over, you have to get ready for the cold, ice, and snow. And yet Joe and Carl wouldn't give up Alaskan winters for anything in the world. That's when they can really savor their Alaska. Well, I think there's a lot of emotions involved with being in the wilderness. For one, you have to be very honest with yourself because if you make mistakes, you could easily die out in the wilderness. So you have to be careful and you have to respect the wilderness for one thing. You really get to appreciate your place in the world. We have to live on nature's terms. We can't change nature to live on our terms. So we have to accept it and we have to see our part in how we fit in. You know, there are still wild places where you can disappear. I know uh, you can still hike out into some wild places and try to make your way and live off the land. And it seems odd that uh, probably most of North America was settled by humans coming from Asia, walking probably right through this landscape right here. But they kept going because they realized that this was not exactly the best place to stop just because of the climate. But now, you know, more and more of us are saying, well, you know, that 
that place was worthwhile. Let's come back and see what we can make of ourselves in that space. The last frontier. This is the dream of everyone living in Alaska. Danielle has just bought a piece of land where she's going to build a trapper's cabin. The myth of the pioneer lives on. This is for the floor of my cabin. The smaller pieces are easier to transport in the airplane. Um, long pieces are difficult. I can transport some, but then the smaller pieces can go inside the airplane. Danielle has chosen to build her dream house on an inaccessible hillside. It's a good place. It's, that's the fun of it, is that it is a challenge. This young woman has not chosen the easy way out. The wind has to be just right in order to land on her little acre of paradise. Only Danielle could have dreamed this one up. I need the wind to blow in the right direction in order to land. Um, either it needs to be really calm or the wind has to be from the right direction. So um, it can be small windows of opportunity to land there. Her own plane is a 1956 canvas-built Piper that looks like something straight out of a cartoon strip. It takes about five minutes to fly there. Um, you cannot drive. It takes about eight hours to hike there, maybe 10, I never hiked. I feel alive for sure. Um, usually like an early morning before everybody's awake, um, when you first take off and feel that airplane leave the ground and it's just the smooth cold air and it just like flying up into a blanket. Um, it's pretty dreamy. I don't know how you could beat that. It's just amazing. I feel fortunate that I'm obsessed with something so fun. <laughs> Within a few years, Danielle became a reputable bush pilot. She can land almost anywhere, something that not many other pilots are capable of doing. Her hill is a long way from being a landing strip. With a slope of more than 20 degrees, landing there is a real challenge. Danielle's plot of land is unique. With a stunning view of Mount McKinley, it's worthy of her dream. I choose this area because it looks the, over the entire valley. And yeah, um, uh, most of the time is down in the forest or in the canopy. Um, so it's nice to have a place to go to where you see over the entire valley. Yeah, it's a perch. <laughs> Alaska is the roof of America, yeah. And then this is the, an awesome roof of the Susitna Valley, yeah. Home, you say, home, you say, home, you say. Home, you say, 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 home, you
The Kingdom of Extremes, Alaska, land of pioneers in the gold rush, carries on and on nourishing our dreams. That's why so many men and women on a quest end up here. In the end, perhaps the true gold of Alaska is freedom. <laughs>